Hello, old dogs. This is your host and top dog, Bill Manicero. Today's show is a special rebroadcast of one of our most popular episodes. I'm introducing the show under the banner, Best of Old Dogs REI Network Podcast. Well, enjoy. In a world where jobs are how most people make money. One man, one desire, one challenge dares to break the mold. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where we don't work for money. Money works for us. Coming soon, viewer discretion advised. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where cash flow is king. Real estate investing, the means, so you can enjoy your retirement dreams. This is the show where we cut right to the chase. No sales pitch, no long monologues, just simple how-to real estate investing advice, so you can earn the passive income you need to enjoy your retirement today. And now, your host and chief old dog, Bill Manacero. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. I'm your host, Bill Manacero, and this is the show where 50 plusers and anyone else who wants to join us get solid, no sales pitch real estate investing advice to help generate real cash flow. This podcast airs twice weekly on Mondays and Fridays. And if you aren't already a subscriber, go to iTunes, type in Old Dog, spelled D A W G, find our podcast, and subscribe. Well, today our guest is, if you are a real estate investor of any type, you already know who he is, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. Brandon Turner. Brandon Turner is an active real estate investor and VP at biggerpockets.com, which as we've surveyed our interviewees and the people that have been on this program, seems to be the number one real estate investing website. When he's not growing his rental portfolio or flipping houses, he's writing books and blog posts on biggerpockets.com, helping others learn how to find financial freedom through real estate investing. Or he's spending time with his lovely wife or enjoying his new, beautiful new baby girl. So you can connect with him on biggerpockets.com. Well, this is uh, a real pleasure to have you on here, Brandon. Um, you were a, a big part of my background in getting involved in real estate investing. And uh, uh, you and uh, Josh have you just really inspired, I'm sure, many, many more um, that have uh, taken the leap and moved into real estate investing. So, Well, thank you. Uh, I uh, thank you for, for being on. I know you're a busy yeah. guy, especially being a new dad. Yeah, that's that's a new thing, you know. It's it's she's a, a little over two months old now, little Rosie, and I'm kind of figuring out how this whole dad thing works. But it's uh it's the best time of my life. It's pretty much uh, the arm outside of the you know getting married. Uh, I mean, there's nothing that beats that. It's yep. wonderful, and you're gonna have a blast. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Ah, uh, oh, great. Well, I, I just kind of gave an overview of uh, your background. Uh, there's a lot we could talk about today, but I just I wanted to just give us a brief background on how, how you got involved in real estate investing. Sure, sure. So I started actually with just a house. I wanted to, uh, you know, I wanted to live somewhere. Of course, I didn't really like living in a box in the street. And so I decided that I would buy myself a house and uh, I, it was cheaper than renting. So I bought a, like a, just a cheap house. I mean, all I knew, all I knew was that I was raised by a garage sale mom, right? So we went garage selling every Saturday and I learned to ha to buy a good deal. And so I thought, well, I don't want to pay a lot for a house. So I went and looked on, on the market and talked to my real estate agent. I said, what's the absolute cheapest house in this area? And she showed me one and I said, okay, let's buy that one. And so we went and bought it and fixed it up. I learned, I mean, I didn't know how to do anything, but I learned kind of how to, you know, lay, I learned how to lay carpet. I learned how to paint. I learned how to fix plumbing. And that took a lot longer than it ever should have. And then I realized I really, really, really enjoyed owning property and fixing it up. So I decided, 
you know what, forget law school, forget all the plans my parents had for me, I'm going to become a real estate investor. So started flipping houses, started buying rental property, and that's how I got into this. Wow, how old were you when you did that? I was 21 when I bought my first property. Wow, that's exciting. That's so great. Yeah. Well, um, since then, you've, you've picked up a few other properties, I understand. And I have. Maybe you could kind of tell us uh, sort of what your, uh, what your current portfolio is like. Sure. So today I've got 52, I believe it is, 52 units. And out of that, there's a, a couple of those are flips. So roughly 50 rental units. Uh, a couple of those are with partnerships. Some of them aren't. Some of them are. Uh, it's just one of the ways I like to finance things. And we can you know, probably talk about that later. Uh, but yeah, roughly 50 units. I've got uh, two active flips going on right now. And I've got seven total, including those two, I've got seven total rehabs going on because uh, I like to rehab rental properties as well. I love, I love buying rental properties, fixing them up and then renting them out. Oh, that's neat. Now, you are, are you primarily, in terms of your buy and hold, primarily buying multifamily at this point? Yeah, I would say primarily. I mean, every once in a while, I buy a single family house. Like, I'm actually buying a single family house right now. Uh, we should close in the next couple of days. But they're usually like different circumstances, like maybe I bought it to flip and decided not to. Or in this case, my best friend didn't want his house anymore. So he said, hey, will you just buy it from me for what I owe on it? And I'm like, okay. So it's like, <laughs> it, it, there's. There's a few reasons I'll buy a single family house, but it's got to be in a good neighborhood. It's got to cash flow. It's got to make sense. It's just, it, it's hard to spend all that time buying a single family house when I can get, I can put the same effort into buying a 10 unit or whatever. Uh, it seems like also the numbers work out better too, you know, because having, you know, a seven different uh, insurance policies and so forth, and, and as opposed to one insurance policy for a seven unit or something. I mean, you know, you kind of add up all these things and it seems to make more sense for me too. But what amazes me is that, uh, okay, just, you know, listening to your show and, uh, and listening to all the things you're doing. And then, and then all of a sudden you say, oh, yeah, I just wrote this new book. And I'll go, when, when does this guy have time to write a <laughs> book? I mean, on top of all this other stuff that you're doing, I mean, it seems cr- – and then you're flipping, which, I, you know, to me seems really time-consuming uh, because, yeah. you know, there's a lot involved in that. Um, and then you're, you must be always looking for a new – properties. And I, so I, I, I'm just like, my mind boggled. You must be the greatest time manager in the world. <laughs> I, 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 no, seriously, I can't understand it. And uh, how do you, for example, how, how are you you're able to even look at deals, have time to, to track down any deals? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I am, I am a very efficient guy. Like I, I'm always reading books and, and articles and blogs and, and talking about time efficiency. So I, I'm a very big time efficiency kind of guy. Like I plot out my day. I mean, I, from this time to this time, I'll be doing this. From this time to this time, I'm doing this. Uh, you know, for writing the book, I got up every day at 5 a.m. and I wrote for two hours every day for 100 days. And so like I'm very efficient in that way. Uh, but I'm also very streamlined in how I do things. Like I know that if I'm going to look for real estate deals, I need to have a process that leads come in and then I analyze those deals every single day and then I make offers on them and then I buy a certain, you know, it's a gigantic funnel, right? So every day I spend, I don't spend a lot of time. I spend maybe 30 minutes a day analyzing deals or looking at stuff. And most of those leads come in from the MLS still. I mean, most of them are terrible deals, but I, my agent, I, and this is just a tip for anybody listening. I mean, call up your real estate agent and say, Hey, can I get automatic email alerts or automatic emails for every property that meets a certain qualification? And most real estate agents can do that. So my agent, every day I get emails from him whenever there's a new property that comes on the market. I'll quickly run through some numbers and figure out if it's worth doing. Uh, so that 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 helps a lot is just having that system and process. I now also have an assistant who works part-time on the real estate stuff and part-time on other just activities in our life. And so she analyzes deals. I actually kind of taught her, here's how you analyze a deal. So you know, spend 15, 20 minutes a day or a half hour a day just looking for potential deals and then – run the numbers. And if it looks enticing, send it over to me and I'll look deeper. Now, is she a virtual assistant or somebody that's actual local? Actually, she's local? actually she's actually local, um, though a person could. I mean, what she does, a person could pretty much do virtually. Uh, I mean, I just really just kind of taught her how to look for deals. She looks on Craigslist. She looks on the uh, like realtor dot com. Uh, she she answers phone calls. We do direct mail marketing a little bit. We don't do a ton. We send them maybe three or four or 500 letters a month uh, out to, um, uh, to absentee owners. So people who own property, but don't live in the property in my County, we'll send them my letters. In addition, we also handwrite letters to every single multifamily owner in my County. And so we have a list of about 500 owners who own multifamily. And we're just going down that list every day. We write, you know, either me or her will write, you know, two or three letters a day and just handwrite them just saying, Hey, 
I'm another landlord in this area. I know you've got some, uh, you know, an apartment complex here. If you're ever looking to sell, I'd love to talk to you about it. We've had some really good conversations. Haven't bought anything since we started that a few months ago uh, from that campaign, but I kind of figure it's a matter of time. Now, I, I can't picture you, again, with, with your schedule, handwriting hundreds of letters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got to yeah, elaborate a little bit on that. <laughs> sure, sure. The three or 400 letters a month that we send. So we do, or I, um, so I did a handwritten font. So what I did is I, I there's a website online and uh, let me pull it up real quick because it's actually fascinating. Uh, let's see, handwritten font. What's this thing called? It's called... Uh, shoot. Now I'm not going to know it. How to, anyway, you'll find it online, I guess, or I'll can find it later and put it in the show notes. But <laughs> if there's a site where you actually, you download or you print, it's totally free. You print out this uh, piece of paper and you, all it is a bunch of boxes and with like really light colored letters, like A, B, C, D, and you handwrite in A, B, C, D, E, F, whatever, all the way through. Then you scan it and you upload it to this website and it creates a font that is exactly your handwriting. No so, way. Yeah. That's it's amazing. Is- it's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, it's so cool. And so then you take this and you put it into Microsoft Word. And then I just did a mail merge, which, uh, you know, is a, obviously a way of like taking a long list of names and then making Microsoft Word print out, you know, three or four or 500 letters at one time, each with a different name on it. So I'm basically handwriting with a computer all of these things. Now, if somebody doesn't want to go through all this trouble, there are a lot of companies who do this for you. I mean, like letter, yellowletters.com is one that comes to mind. Uh, they can do this for you. It's just a little more expensive. I'm cheap, and so I decided to do it myself. So we're probably spending, you know, 30 cents, maybe you're with, with stamps, probably 60, 70 cents a letter uh, versus h- hiring a company like that to do it, you might pay a dollar fifty. Wow, that's it. what a great idea! I never heard, this is the first time I ever heard that. That's great. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I was trying to find the website. It's such, it's such a cool like uh, thing. I wrote a, I think I wrote a blog post on it. Can I can I give you the URL for the blog post? Yes. All right. So I think it's biggerpockets.com slash. Let me just check this before I tell everyone. I think it's slash DM letter. DM like direct mail. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's just bigger biggerpockets.com slash DM, like direct mail letter. And it'll take you to an article I wrote that teaches you how to do the handwritten font thing and even shows you the exact letter that I send out to people. And there's no opt-in or nothing. It's just, it's just a blog post I wrote because I thought it would help people out. So God, that's great. I love it. Um, you must be a real, a real big systems guy, are you? Yes. I mean, do you, you have these like things just like calculated out? I and- try. <laughs> do you have like a little <laughs> operational notebook or something that you work off of to do this? Sort of. I'm, I'm putting one together. I mean, we've always kind of just just done stuff because that's, we just do it. But the more and more I, I realize if I want to scale this business, I have to get systems and processes together. And so my goal ultimately is to have everything documented and written so that if I got hit by a bus and somebody came in to manage my business, they could take over from day one and, know ex- and it, nothing would drop. It would just run exactly the same. You know, that's kind of the mentality behind the book, The E-Myth, or The E-Myth Revisited. Right. Yeah, make your business run like a machine, like an engine. You know, your your oil needs to be changed. You pull the oil out, put no oil in, and it's back to normal. Or, you know, you I don't know anything about cars, but you take your uh, whatever reverse collapsation magic tool out, and you put another <laughs> one in, and it just works again, right? Uh, because that's how engines are built. They're very efficient. I want my business to run that way as well. Oh, that's neat. Well, um, looking at your at your real estate experience and things that you've done, I wanted to zero in on, on a couple of learning lessons that we can present for our listeners. And uh, uh, maybe you could zero in on maybe your biggest mistake first, um, and then after that, maybe the biggest success. Um, sure. And, uh, you know, what it was and how you learned from it. Sure. Good question. So biggest mistake I probably ever made was uh, when I first – and I – this is kind of covers multiple properties, but then I'll give you a specific example. So when I started, I didn't really know how to analyze deals very well. And so what I would do is I would kind of look at them and go, that house is $42,000. That's really cheap. It must be a good deal. And then I would buy it because I just assumed that if it was cheap, it was a good deal. Uh, That was a huge mistake that got me in trouble several times. I've gotten you know, a lot of my early properties, I didn't analyze them. I just used my head like, okay, yeah, I think the mortgage would be about this much and probably rent for about this much. So I should be doing pretty good. You know, I didn't really know how to lay out like how to account for the fact that it's going to sit vacant for 5% of the year or whatever, or 
I'm going to have to put a new roof on it every 20 years and divide that out of over 20 years and 12 months each year. You know, how much do I need to set aside every year for the roof and those kind of things? You know, I didn't know how to calculate any of that stuff. All I did was just like, saw cheap equals good. So uh, I used to buy a lot of junk that I should have never bought. And today I don't really make any money on it because I might make three or four thousand dollars over the course of a year and then I'll spend five thousand dollars on a new you know whatever back porch because it was falling down you know things like that right. so that was a huge mistake which is not knowing how to analyze deals very well uh, and another example of, of that is I bought a house that was a, a, a duplex and I decided I was going to turn it into a single family house and I was going to flip it now this was located in a great location I got a killer good deal on it uh, and I mean, it was really a fantastic duplex. And I thought, you know, I'm, I love those flipping shows. I'm going to flip it. So I didn't, again, I didn't do the numbers very well. I didn't know how to analyze it right. I just went in there and my wife and I started working on it. We spent a solid 12 months of our life every single day, 40, 50, 60 hours a week working physically on this flip. And I mean, I ripped out the outside staircase that went to the second unit and I built this grand staircase up the middle. I mean, travertine tiles, wood, I mean, cherry wood floors. It was amazing. Uh, anyway, it sat on the market for a solid year. And then at the end of the day, it finally sold. Uh, and when I ran the numbers at the end and figured out what I actually made on the property, I lost 10 grand. <laughs> so I, I wasted wow. two years of my life and yeah. lost 10 grand. The, the worst part was when I looked at it later, and I said, you know, just hypothetically, what if I would have kept it as a duplex? What if I would have just kept it and put less money into it because it was already pretty much done, just needed paint and carpet at that point? I looked and I realized I would have, making close, I would have been making close to $1,000 a month in cash flow on that wow. property forever. I mean, for, for as long as I held it till I paid the mortgage off, then I'd be making like, you know, 2000 a month in cash flow. It was crazy. Uh, and so that was a huge mistake and huge learning lesson was, you know, do your numbers and look at the highest and best use for a property. Just because you're excited about flipping because you watched a TV show doesn't mean that's the best uh, choice for you and your financial future. How about your biggest success? I would probably say it was my 24-unit apartment complex. And I say that because of the kind of unique way in which we financed it. So I was a 23 or 24-year-old kid. I had done a few flips. I had done a few rentals. I was in the middle of that disaster flip that turned in, you know, the two-year thing. And uh, I kind of knew what I was doing a little bit, but I had absolutely no money. I mean, really no money. I mean, I maybe had $1,000 in my bank account, and uh, which I don't usually advise people to go that tight on budget, but I was building a real estate portfolio and I had no money because I wasn't making anything. And so I wanted, so I had a conversation with this uh, couple from my church actually, and I was just telling them how much I really wanted to buy an apartment complex someday. And they looked at me kind of funny and said, oh, that's weird because we actually have an apartment complex that we want to sell. And uh, it just started this conversation that a year later we ended up closing on it. Uh, but to do it, I mean, I had no money to buy a 24-unit apartment complex. Now, they didn't want a ton of money for it. I mean, at the time it was half vacant, needed a ton of work. And uh, long story short, we basically ended up doing five different creative financing strategies all combined to make this thing work. I mean, for example, we started with uh, a lease option. So I rented the entire property from them with an option to buy it later on. And during that time, I, I fixed a bunch of units up, got them rented out, saved up some cash flow to be able to give them a little bit of a down payment, which then we turned this into a seller finance deal. So they actually carried the financing on it. But then I realized I didn't have enough money for the rehab, so I partnered with my parents on it and said, hey, will you guys lend me money from your line of credit, which is the other way that we did it. We used a line of credit then of theirs to do the rehab of it, and I'll give you guys uh, you know, 50% someday when we sell it. And then we went and refinanced it with a portfolio lender a couple of years later. And so it took five different creative strategies to put that thing together. And uh, it, I, I'm not going to say that I sat there at the beginning and went, okay, this is my plan. Here's how I'm going to do this. I mean, that was dozens and dozens of late nights thinking, talking with dozens of different investors. You can go back on the bigger pockets forums that I'm asking people there five years ago, you know, how do I, how do I put this deal together? And uh, after a lot of conversations, we finally just made it work. Wow. What a neat story. That's, uh, yeah. that is great. I, um, I could probably discuss hundreds of topics with you. I, it literally, <laughs> no, I've never read like so many of your articles, yeah, you know, there's awesome. so many different areas. It's great. But one, one area that I thought would be really, really good to, to address because, uh, most of 
our listeners are either getting ready for retirement or already retired. And the many are fixed incomes and maybe limited reserves. And um, they're looking at real estate investing as a means to be able to you know, boost up their, their cash flow so that they can enjoy their retirement years, be able to do things that they might normally not be able to, like hop on a plane and go see, you know, their yeah. grandkids or, or go to graduation here, there, whatever it may be. And, and they're seriously looking at, uh, at real estate investing. Some are already there, but uh, the question I get asked a lot is, you know, can a person really buy a property with no money down? Yeah. I mean, Yes, you can definitely do it. Uh, whether you should do it is a whole different question, and we can talk about that as well. Uh, there are a lot of ways. I mean, here's a, a good example I like to give people. Let's just say, um, Bill, so let's just say that there was a property down the street from you that the owner wanted $1,000 to buy it. But let's just pretend, Bill, that you had zero dollars. Or the people listening, put, the, put yourself in this kind of exercise here. You have zero, I mean, you have nothing. For some reason, you have no money. But down the street, they want a thousand bucks for this property. But if you were to buy it today for a thousand dollars, tomorrow you could sell it for a million, right? So let's just, hypothetically, you have zero dollars, but they want a thousand bucks. My question to, I ask people is, how would you do that? If you knew you're going to make a million dollars tomorrow, just by coming up with a thousand today, how would you come up with that thousand today? And then people start thinking, they say, well, you know, I would probably borrow the thousand dollars or, you know, I'd probably partner with someone and tell them I'd give them half a million if they gave me the thousand. Or, you know what, I'd actually probably just take a loan out on my car. I got a car, uh, you know, paid off. I'd take a loan out on that. Or I got a house. I'll take a loan out on that. Or, uh, you know, there's a lot of scenarios where somebody could come up with a thousand dollars. Well, I mean, the exact same principle applies to real estate, right? If you don't have the money, ask yourself, how do I get this money? How do I afford this? So like I said earlier, one of my favorite ways is partnerships. When I didn't have any money at all, I would go to people and say, look, I've got experience and I've got time and I've got hustle and I've got you know, some knowledge on how to do this real estate thing. So what do you say we work together on something? You come up with a down payment and I'll do everything else. And I mean, for the, for the person who, you know, I, I worked with multiple people doing this, you know, somebody comes to them and says, Hey, I'll basically do every bit of work in the entire world. All you need to come up with is $20,000 down payment. These people were ecstatic. And today they're making amazing returns because they don't have to do anything at all. And they partnered with somebody who was doing all the work. So again, I didn't have any money, but I asked myself, how do I make this happen? And I made it happen. So yes, you definitely can. Uh, the question I said earlier is, should you? Uh, you know, I don't generally advise people to invest when they're flat broke. I mean, you should have a, you know, some reserve, some emergency fund, because I don't want anybody to get in trouble. And, you know, there's a learning curve when you're getting in real estate. You got to kind of figure things out. So make sure you got at least something, some kind of backup before you uh, jump in. Now, do you have sort of a, a priority that you look at? For example, uh, you know, here's this property. I want to get it. Do you immediately go to the seller first? Uh, do you look at your own, you know, sphere of influence? You might be able to get funds. Do you have sort of a priority or you just kind of, it just depends on the situation? Yeah. I mean, it kind of depends on the situation and what I'm doing it for. I do always, I always like to ask, do you have a mortgage on it? Because if they don't, then maybe they are open to seller financing. Uh, though it's, it's fairly rare. I mean, even though a third of all houses in America are owned without a mortgage, which means a third of all properties out there are open for seller financing, uh, which was a number that I did when I was, I, I discovered when I was researching for the book on investing with no and low money down. And I was shocked by that. A third of all houses have no mortgage. So anyway, people who are looking for seller financing, they are out there. There's a lot of houses and properties that are owned free and clear. That said, uh, I typically will look at a deal like this. Um, one of my favorite ways to finance deals today is I look and say, can I get a private lender, somebody who's just got a good, you know, a good amount of money in their checking account or savings account or whatever, can I get a private lender to fund this deal? including the rehab costs. Now, it's got to be a really good deal to make that work. But can I get somebody to fund the entire deal and the rehab costs? Then I can fix it up or have somebody fix it up. I hire contractors. And then we'll go to a bank and get a refinance. In other words, a brand new loan to pay off the private lender, maybe a private lender, maybe a year later. Uh, so I call the strategy the Burr strategy because you buy a property, you rehab it, you rent it out, then you refinance and then you repeat. So B R R R R. Uh, so again, I like the strategy a lot. I try to fit almost everything within this strategy lately, just because it's been working so well for me. Uh, and there's a lot of benefits to doing it. I mean, you buy these 
fix your upper properties that nobody else wants. So you can get a good deal. You get to fix them up. So your rehab, your repairs and your capital expenditures later on are almost non-existent. Uh, you get to know the property like very, very well. You know what it does, what it doesn't do. I mean, you get a good idea of it. You attract better tenants because you got a fixed up property. And there's all these benefits and you build equity in it, almost immediate equity. I don't buy a property if it doesn't have equity. Now, you uh, mentioned, too, if they, if they didn't have a mortgage on it, that you would look at seller financing. What if they do have a, a mortgage um, and maybe it's assumable? Um, would you assume it and have them take out a second? Sure. So I've never done an assumable mortgage. I mean, those were so prevalent back in the day. And today, a lot of mortgages don't have them anymore. So if you can find people with them, that can be great. Uh, what I've done instead is I've done lease options. So I'll tell you about a deal that I'm actually negotiating right now as we, not as we speak, but in like this week, we've been talking about it. This guy wants to sell a property. It's a duplex. He's asking 150000 for it. It was on the MLS. So a real estate agent had been selling it for 150,000. And I didn't even look at it because I just thought it was overpriced at 150,000. And I never even ran the numbers and shame on me for not running the numbers earlier, but I just kind of assumed it was not a good deal. Well, when finally I started looking into it, it came off the market. So it's no longer on the market. It expired. Nobody else bought it. And then I looked at the numbers and I realized, actually, this is, this is actually a pretty decent deal. So we're in negotiation right now with them. And one of the things that we're offering them is what if we were to just do a lease option, which I talked about earlier with the apartment complex. In other words, I'll rent this property from you. I'll rent the whole duplex from you. And I'm going to pay you exactly what the mortgage is. And so their mortgage is, let's say, $600 a month. I will pay you guys $600 a month, but I'm going to pay that directly to the mortgage company just to make sure that it's getting paid. And then I'm going to rent it out to somebody else. And so essentially, I'm going to hopefully be able to get this duplex for pretty much no money down because I'm buying it. I'm, I'm just renting it. I'm not actually owning it yet. Now, later on, because it's a lease option, it's two things. It's a lease, so I'm renting it, but I also have a legal option to buy it within a certain number of years. So I've done that a few times now. It's worked out really well every time I've done it and uh, hopefully going to pull it off on this duplex as well. Now, with the, the 24 unit, you said you also did a, a lease option. What would distinguish that from, let's say, a master lease, or would you say they're one and the same? I would say they're, they're one and the same the way that I use them. Now, technically, we usually, when talking with commercial properties or apartment complexes, usually the term is master lease. Uh, I just am so used to saying lease option. That's what I usually say. But it's like, I mean, pretty much the same thing. Here's a difference that people might separate. A master lease typically means everything is, is paid, meaning I pay taxes, I pay the insurance, I'm paying everything as the buyer or the renter, right? Um, a lease option usually is a little more like on a house the te- the I'm not going to pay the tax and insurance that's just part of the mortgage so again they're they're a little bit fuzzy the definitions um so I guess yeah technically I did a master lease option you could say yeah master lease would be without the option a master lease option would be with it uh, but yeah kind of blurry lines there okay good well th- thanks i'm you know i'm still learning so <laughs> I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. i'll ask these dumb questions well, i never really thought about actually the the differences there so it's good for me to kind of think this through it's been uh yeah it's good it's good hey do you only buy local i never heard you really talk about out-of-state properties yeah. and so forth yeah right now i only buy local and i do that for a couple of reasons one because i know the market really really well i mean i know that one block over from one spot might be great and one might be terrible. Uh, I also do it because it works in my area. Now, if either one of those two things weren't true, then I wouldn't buy local necessarily. I mean, like I, if the numbers didn't work, I probably wouldn't buy local because it wouldn't make sense. And if I didn't know the area, then it doesn't make any more sense to buy local versus somewhere else. Uh, so because I know the area, because it's, the numbers work, I like to buy local. I am looking for larger, like, property is I'd love to buy a 50 unit apartment somewhere in the Midwest. I would love to do that. Uh, but I don't, I'm not looking that hard. I guess I'm, I'm casually looking, which is probably not going to give me anything until I start taking that more seriously. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I didn't, I mean, I, I live in Southern California. When I first bought, yeah. started buying real estate, I was in Haiti. And so I, I, you know, didn't want to buy local there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some certain things just didn't feel right. But, um, when I started buying and now and living in Southern California, it's no different. I, I just can't buy here. There's, you know, there's the, yeah. there's, it's real hard to get, you know, decent cash flow. Uh, and I mean, you could definitely do it on equity play um, because the real estate values are going up and up and up, but, sure. uh, but it makes sense. And, and for a lot of people, you know, listening that, that may be in those, those sort of expensive areas, New York or, or wherever it may be, um, 
buying out of state makes a lot of sense. Um, and uh, sure. but it's a whole different dynamic, obviously, um, than than what you're dealing with when you have something local and you really know your market that well. Yeah, very much so. You know, when, and I'm sure there's people listening to this right now who, when I said earlier, because it happens all the time, right? I said $150,000 for a duplex. There's always somebody who's like, oh, that would never work in my area. I can't find a duplex for, I can't find a parking spot for $150,000. <laughs> yes. I'm going to shut, yeah, I'm going to shut this off. I'm not going <laughs> to listen, right? But other people are like, 150000 for a duplex? I would never pay that much money. I mean, I can buy a duplex for $12 and a pack of smokes out here in Detroit, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> people have like, I mean, the market's different everywhere. But you know what? There are successful real estate investors in every single solitary market in America today. There are people making it happen. And so you got to ask yourself, what is work? If you want to invest locally, what is working locally? If you, if you, and if it, that doesn't match with what you're trying to do, what your goals are, then yeah, look elsewhere. Just look carefully. The biggest advice I give people for looking elsewhere, or maybe the, I should say the biggest mistake I think people make when they invest elsewhere is they let other people do the numbers for them. They let other people do the due diligence. So they might call a turnkey company and say, yeah, you know, these companies that provide rentals out of state. So you might call somebody over in the Midwest and say, yeah, I want to buy a rental property. And they say, great, we've got this house here. It's a hundred thousand dollars. And you'll be making $500 a month in cash flow. And you're like, great, where do I send the check? And you send the check off and all of a sudden you realize the first month that you made no money. In the second month, you lost money. In the third month, you lost money because you didn't run your own numbers. And so if you're gonna invest out of state, make sure you run your own numbers and try to have somebody with boots on the ground in that area, somebody who knows the market that you can you know, trust to tell you where the good spots and the bad spots are. Yeah, I, I kind of learned that the hard way. My first three properties were were all turnkey properties. Okay, yep. And I had, uh, you know, there was, I mean, basically they just had temporary tenants in there. And uh, after the deal was closed, um, the tenants just disappeared. Oh man. Um, so yeah, it, it's you, you, and you definitely have to do even with the turnkey, do your your due diligence, uh, um, or otherwise you. Have, and actually, I had uh, my best experience was uh, on uh, bigger pocket pockets.com when I was faced with that and I had this uh, this duplex in Memphis that was just it was empty and and uh, the turnkey had a six month guarantee okay that they were covering my rent that should have been a red flag in itself but uh, <laughs> oh this is great they got a six month guarantee well why do they have it and uh, after the six months <laughs> were over <laughs> yep. I, I just I was freaking out and I go on bigger pockets and uh, we had this this long train of of um, you know just comments and feedback from people but it was so helpful for me um, you you know, I had people that basically said, you know, just sell, you know, sell now. You're, you're going to get your, you know, take your losses, you know. And then suddenly this one guy emerges out of Memphis and he said, well, I know the area. And other people are saying it's a war zone. It's really bad news and everything. And he's going, um, I grew up in that area. And he goes, and I also happen to be a property manager. And uh, oh, nice. and we started talking. And so now this guy manages this pro this these properties for me in Memphis. And, uh, it's, it was all cause of bigger pockets. It was like amazing. And, that's uh, cool. and it just turned out to be, you know, from a horrible situation to just, uh, just wonderful. He's like the best property manager I have in all this, the cities I'm involved in. I mean, it's just, it's great. So that's cool. Important thing for people to know too, going into this, it's the relationships you have, you know, that really make a difference here. And so true. And I've made so many relationships through Bigger Pockets. It's it's a networking place. It's it's for those that can't maybe get to the REI clubs or whatever it is. You know that, um, you know, you just meet people online, and I met such great quality people there. And and not to say that they're all wonderful. I, I've met all yeah. of them. <laughs> yeah, there's <laughs> but, some jerks everywhere. <laughs> but I've met some great people and stuff. So you know, that's just another great great option. I you know throw out for people too that are afraid to, to make the move, you know, get feedback, get feedback. And man, you know, you do get tons of feedback, which is great. What's sort of your goal, your end game? Where do you want to go before you, you kind of just kind of kick back a little bit and, you know, the sure. kids are grown and you guys are traveling all over the globe together, whatever. Uh, what, what, what sort of, what, what is your, your plan? Yeah. You know, currently my goal is a hundred units and that's been my goal for a little while now. Uh, now I read the 10 X rule by Grant Cardone and it says multiply your goals by 10. So then I was like, okay, it's going to be a thousand. But then, uh, I've been kind of scaling back and said, you know what? I don't, I don't know if I want to live a lifestyle that owns a thousand units necessarily. Uh, I, I recently read a book called life and air. Have you ever read that? No, I haven't. Okay, it's called Life and Air, kind of like Millionaire, but with the word life in front of it. So Life and Air. And uh, it really challenged me in a lot of ways in, in terms of 
you know, if, if the ultimate goal of my life is to make as much money as I can and just be as rich as I possibly can, yeah, a thousand units makes a lot of sense, but that's not the goal of my life. I mean, it, the goal of my life is far different than just money. So it kind of made me think of what do I want my life to look like and what does that mean for real estate? How can it get me there? And the way I look at it, I say, if I had a hundred units that were each giving me a hundred dollars per month in cash flow, so that's roughly what's that $10,000 a month in, in income. If I can make 10,000 a month in income and that's, that's after all expenses and including setting aside money for repairs and vacancy and CapEx and all those things. If I could clear hundred dollars per month per unit, that's $120,000 a year. That's complete. Like in my mind, that's complete freedom money to do whatever I want for the rest of my life. I mean, uh, and I'm probably, I've got, like I said, 50 units right now. So I'd like over the next year or so to acquire another 50. And at that point, yeah, maybe I want to I wanna buy some larger apartment complexes. I would love that. Uh, but first, I'd like to get to that 100 unit and then, uh, you know, see where the road takes me there. That's neat that you'd say that. Uh, we had, uh, I think, episode 09, uh, Susan Laster Lyons. I don't know. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's real funny. She was she was on the track. She's just, you know, very aggressive goals. And, and she finally did this, you know, talk about light bulb moments where she just stopped and she said, what am I doing? You know, and here's her dollar, you know, amounts that she's going for and yep. yeah, whatever it was, 100,000, 200,000 a month or whatever she was trying to do. And, and she finally just stopped and she just said, you know, <laughs> I, I, I want to. I want to just be comfortable and I want to be able to have time and I want to enjoy life and, you know, my, my niece and nephews and so forth. And, and, um, you know, it was, it was really neat and refreshing to hear because, you know, I think in this, sometimes in this universe, we're surrounded by these people that are so goal oriented. Of course, yeah. everybody that listens to this is laughing, laughing because they know I have a goal of a thousand units by 2020. Yep. <laughs> so, and so, it's not a bad thing, but yeah, it, yeah but I'm, I'm trying to support a, a mission in, in, Haiti too. So that's really, I mean, we don't need that kind of money, but, sure. but, uh, you know, we really do believe in what we're doing over there. And so, so for me, it's, it, you know, I, I don't want the, the Ferraris and all that stuff. I, you know, <laughs> I, I just want to join my kids, my grandkids and, and be able to help out these wonderful kids in Haiti. So, so it's a kind of a different, different motivation, but, uh, and, and again, you know, if I, if I don't make it, you know, I'm, I'm live and people are <laughs> going to be able to say, yep. well, so much for listening to that podcast. This guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, um, you know, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I totally get what you're saying. And I think that's really where it's got to be. It's got to be quality of life. And yeah, um, gosh, I, I think it, may, it might even been on one of your broadcasts that I, I remember hearing one guy saying that, you know, that he just uh, he mapped out like his perfect day and he, t he t did, you know, sort of a 24 hour thing. This is yep. my perfect day. And what do I have to do to get to that? And I think he counted backwards. He looked at what the average lifespan of a male, you know, and, and uh, you know, he, he, he literally wrote down how many days he had left. And, uh, and, well, he, and he would every day he'd look at that, you know, and he'd cross it off the number and make it one number less. And, <laughs> that's uh, a good idea. That's yeah, it's, idea. it's really kind of a neat. And there's a book that goes with it. Of course, I don't remember it because I'm, I'm an old dog here. But, <laughs> uh, but no, I, you know, it's just a really neat thing. It's just, you know, look at what, what is your, your sort of perfect, you know, scenario. And, uh, you know, it's really it may not take as much as you think to get to that. And so yeah. I, I, I really appreciate you sharing that, uh, Brandon. That's, that's great. Yeah. And you know, you know what my, when I was 21, I set a goal of, I wanted 30 units each giving me a hundred bucks a month per unit. Uh, so I could get $3,000 a month. Cause that's what I, at the time I needed to live was 3000 a month. And so I did that and it took me six years to get there. And so I say that because a lot of people listen to the show again, you have a, you, you know, you, you cater to the older audience, you know, the older dogs out there. And so like a lot of people are thinking, well, you know, maybe I'm past where I, you know, maybe I'm too late to get started in real estate. But I mean, I was 21 with no money whatsoever. And within six years, I hit that goal of 3000 a month. That was what I wanted to survive. So, I mean, people listen to this in six years from now, five years from now, four years from now, you guys have, edu you guys have education, you have content, you have podcasts that I never dreamed of having at the time. And, uh, Anyway, I mean, if you're, you're, maybe it's too late. Maybe it's too late to get 20,000 units or whatever by the time you're, you know, 50 if you're 49 today. But, you know, maybe if you want enough to be able to, yeah, go travel when you want to go see grandkids or kids or, or you know, go see Europe or whatever, you know. It, real estate can be 
is probably one of the fastest ways to be able to do that uh, in the most secure way without, you know, robbing banks or something. No, and, and I believe that too, you know, and I think that's what's so great about it because there's there are people there that are just saying, gee, if I just had $500 a month extra or $1,000 yep. a month, and if you could buy, a, you know, a duplex for cash and, yep. uh, you know, you could easily do that in one transaction. And yep. um, it's it's real doable, it's feasible, and and I think, I mean, I just wish more people knew about that and, yeah. and, and would really, really, you know, take a look at it. I, I personally, you know, feel that, you know, that was, that was my scenario. You know, I, I was a missionary. We didn't have any, we lived on faith for most of our lives. And so, you know, all of a sudden I'm faced with, you know, having to come back to the States and I'm going, wow, you know, what am I going to do, you know, and stuff. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, was, I was just, you know, <laughs> figuring I'd be in the blue vest at Walmart handing out parts, <laughs> you know, I just figured that I was going to hire, you know, a 60 year old guy, you know, and, um, but but, you know, as I started to look at it and I and started to grow these investments that I had, I, I said, gee, you know, this could be it. And it could really, um, really fill that gap. So so it's really great. And, I, and, and I, I'm going to mention again the book here. I, I've got it sitting right in front of me here, the, the book on investing in real estate with no and low money down, uh, real life strategies for investing in real estate using other people's money. I think it's is a, a neat, I'm excited. I'm going to try some of this stuff. And I've, I've never really done any of the, the no money down or low money down thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, loving this book. So well, thank you. Um, we've kind of run a little bit longer than I thought, but I, I hope that's okay with you. Oh, it's good with me. Yeah. I love, I love talking real estate. Oh, this is great. Um, we, we have a session now we call wrap it up. And uh, this is uh, where we ask you a series of quick questions. Cool. Anyway, so let's uh, wrap it up. Are you ready? I am ready to rock. All right. Favorite real estate book. So one of so one of my favorite real estate books of all time is called The Unofficial Guide to Real Estate Investing by a guy named Spencer Strauss. And there's an, uh, something stone, maybe David Stone, something like that. Anyway, you can get it on Amazon. It's an old book. It's probably, and there's a couple editions of it. Uh, but I, I don't, for some reason, that book just hit me at the right time for real estate. I mean, I just got so much out of it. I mean, there's there's things like obviously Rich Dad, Poor Dad and The Millionaire Real Estate Investor and, and those kind of books. But this book really like laid out for me like a very step-by-step like this is what real estate rental properties can do for you. And it just totally changed my life. Uh, great. Yeah, the unofficial guide to real estate investing. How about your best uh, Bigger Pockets book? I like, oh, I mean, <laughs> all right. So there's obviously the No and Low Money Down one, which I like a lot. Uh, there's also the book on rental property investing, which is the last one that I wrote. Well, I wrote two at the same time. Those 100 days that we wrote the books, actually my wife and I wrote one together and then we wrote one separate. So the book on rental property investing is like 120 or 110,000 words. It's massive. It's almost three times longer than the, the book on no and low money down. And then the book on managing rental properties is even longer. And so uh, both those are on how to buy rental properties and how to find them, fi finance them, all that good stuff. And then uh, the other ones on how to manage them. So I spent a lot of time on those, so I'm pretty proud of them. Great. Love it. Uh, favorite business book? The One Thing uh, by Gary Keller and Jay Papazan. I've read that book probably 15 times, and I still read it over and over and over because I just absolutely love that book. This is one's going to sound dumb, but the most valuable website for success? Google.com. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> People have I'll, given that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with uh, biggerpockets.com, though... Uh, you know, that's probably an obvious one. I do like bigger pockets a lot. No, but other than my own. So I'm going to go with, uh, hmm, that's a really good question. Let's see. What do I use a lot? I'm going to go with actual realtor.com. Now, everybody in different areas has different websites that work for their area uh, because of the way that the MLSs work. Uh, but for my area, realtor.com is a great place for me to look for deals. I just, I like the layout of their site. And so I'll analyze deals every day from that site. Even if they're not, even if I know they're not going to be good deals, I still analyze them to find out what number would make it a good deal, you know, and then, and then maybe I'll go off on that. So yeah, realtor.com, I'll, I'll say that one. Favorite app. Ooh, favorite app. Uh, My Fitness Pal is probably the one I use the most, which is one that you track your calories. But uh, uh, let's see. You know, you know, I'm a big Instagram fan. I'm looking at my phone right now. <laughs> I listen to a ton of music. But in terms of, I want to think of what one's going to help me with real estate the most. You know what I, I really like a lot is Periscope. Oh, yeah. a, you know, are, like, you, are you guys do? Do you do that? Do you have your? So uh, Periscope? I do Periscope from time to time. Maybe once every other week, I'll do a Periscope, which is like a live video. And so Facebook has it as well, Facebook Live video. But I like Periscope a lot. You just, I, I like to just 
Whenever I go out and look at a property, well, not every time, but a lot of times I go out and look at properties, I'll just turn my Periscope on and I'll just take people with. And the reason that Periscope's a cool app, if you follow a bunch of real estate investors, they do that. So you can learn a ton about like real life. Like let's, why do they, like what are they thinking when they walk through a house? Why do they like something? Why don't they like something? So I like Periscope a lot for that. That's great. I'm gonna follow you on that. I didn't know you did Yeah, that. I do it. That's great, cool. Yeah, I need to do more of it. I just never think of doing it, so. Final question. Let's say a disaster happened. You lost sure. everything. Okay, uh, your properties, everything. All you've got is $1,000 in the bank and you had to start all over. Um, what would you do with that $1,000? I would find somebody who's already doing real estate in my area and I would go and partner with them. And I would say this, I would go up to somebody that's already successful. Uh, for example, my buddy Kyle, he buys property in my area, we're friends. I would go to him and say, Kyle, I wanna, I wanna build up my portfolio again because I have nothing now and I'm pretty much broke. So if I find you an amazing deal, if I find us an amazing deal and I hustle by you know hit, pounding the pavement, just getting out there looking for good deals, if I find something really, really good, will you partner with me on it? Uh, and you know we'll figure out a way to make it work together. And of course he would say yes, because it works for him, it works for me. And I would then work with him to build up my portfolio until I had the money or the uh, ability to start buying them purely on my own. So I would partner with somebody. Great, great idea. Anything else you might add? Any special things going on that um, you want to let people know about at Bigger Pockets? BP's got a cool lead manager coming out pretty soon. Nobody really knows about that. So your audience is kind of the first one to hear about it now, I guess. Uh, basically, wow. yeah, we got a way of uh, like tracking all your leads. So you go out and do driving for dollars. You can put in your leads on your phone or if you're out there you know, on the MLS, if you get direct mail marketing, whatever, you can put all your leads in and then you can track them through the funnel. So you go from your lead to, hey, I talked to them on the phone today. So you write that information in there and now it's in the analysis part and now it's in the offer part and now it's in the closed part and kind of a way for you to track and be able to systematize. It's all about systematizing. Like that's kind of why we built it based off how I run my business uh, to help people be able to do that so that if they're working a full-time job or if they're busy, they can stay organized with their leads. So anyway, check it. That'll be out soon. I'm not sure when. It's supposed to be out like this week, but it's probably going to be another month. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> so that's how development works. It takes forever to oh, find a million neat. bugs. Is it like a contact manager type thing? Uh, yeah, it's kind of like a contact manager, kind of like a CRM in a way. Uh, but it's I don't even know exactly how to describe it because I've never really used any other thing like this. I just sat down and we said, how do I manage my business currently? And I was using Excel mostly. And I'm like, I don't like using Excel. What would be like my ideal way to manage all of my leads that come in and keep everything organized and amazing? And so I just mapped out exactly what I would want. And I gave it to our developers and said, here, build this. And that was six months ago and they've been building it ever since. So I'm really excited for it. I think it's going to make a lot of people a lot of money and help people out a lot. Oh, that's neat. Well, thanks for sharing that with uh, our old dog listeners. Here. That's great. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, good. yeah. Well, good. Well, how can people uh, reach you and, uh, you know, find out more about uh, what you do at uh, Bigger Pockets and what Bigger Pockets does? Sure. I mean, they can probably find me. I mean, I'm on Bigger Pockets constantly writing articles and the Bigger Pockets podcast and all that. I'm also a big Instagram guy. I like Facebook and uh, Twitter. So any of those is probably good. And yeah, I'm sure you you can't avoid me. My personal website's brandonturner.me. If anybody wants to check out that, it's just kind of like who I am. And that's about it. Oh, cool. Great. Great. Well, um, you know, at the end of our show, we have this tradition here where um, all of our guests uh, get to show us really what they're worth here in terms of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> of you know, giving us their best old hound dog howl. Now, you know, you're up in Washington State. I'm sure there's lots of hound dogs around. And uh, uh, so I, I know you know how they, they sound. So why don't you just go ahead and just uh, give us your best shot? Sure. I've been looking forward to this all day. All right. So we have a lot of werewolves out here. So this is going to be my old dog <laughs> werewolf uh, howl. So are you ready for it? All right. Three, two, one. Oh! Oh, there that was go. great. That was great. You know, uh, we're thinking at the end of the year of actually taking all these howls that different people have done and then having a little contest and uh, <laughs> awesome. and then uh, zeroing on the best howl. So you, you may get the Golden Howl Award. Oh, I better. I can't guarantee it, but, you know, that was definitely <laughs> a candidate. So uh, oh, Good, just, good. <laughs> well, great. Well, thank you so much, Brandon, for being on the show. Uh, thank this you. was such a thrill. Probably, probably more for me than anybody because I, I was just thinking, gee whiz, you know, I just – I 
I've gained so much information and knowledge from Bigger Pockets, both the podcast you guys do, as well as the, um, you know, just the articles and the resources on site. And and I think you know what's really neat too is you know we're our podcast, our network is is really. I mean, there's we don't charge for anything, and and we're we're you know we're we're doing this because we understand that one you know as we benefit you know in in real estate investing that we put back in, and you guys have the same philosophy in that um, so much of what you guys do is is free, and and there's no yeah. hooks to it, and there's no. I mean, it's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful, and so. I, I ask all of our guests to come on. What's their favorite real estate website? And I'd say ninety percent of the time, it's BiggerPockets.com. So that's awesome. um, it's it is a it's a great resource for people, especially people getting started um, that may not have the resources to you know to go into these you know twenty thousand dollars a month uh, you know uh, <laughs> a coaching yep. things or whatever is out there. You know, <laughs> um, so it's really really a neat resource. I can't stress it enough. So uh, uh, we really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, old dog listeners, uh, just so you know, everything Brandon has presented here, um, even the things he's talked about, the, the links and all that uh, will, can be accessed in our show notes on olddogsreinetwork.com. And uh, for those of you that took out time today to listen to our podcast, I know there are a lot of other things you could be doing right now, but the fact that you've taken the time to join us here really means a lot to us, and uh, we really appreciate it. So, so thank you for listening. So until next time, remember, cash flow is king here and real estate investing the means. Thanks again for listening, and God bless. Thank you very much for visiting the Old Dogs REI Network. We would greatly appreciate if you would stop by iTunes and let us know what you think of the show. We would love if you could subscribe to the podcast, give us a five-star rating, and write a review. The more ratings and reviews we receive, the more visible the podcast will be to others. Thank you.